Um, good morning. So let's uh, let's start this presentation for 40 minutes. So today I will talk about stream, streaming technology and uh, how it can help Formula One or racing car uh, in general. And I will explain how I did and why we did with some friends uh, these presentations and the demonstrations. So I'm Tug. I'm uh, Tug Dualgral. I'm working as a technical evangelist at MAPAR. MAPAR provides a, a big data platform that I use for my demonstration. And uh, I mostly work always as uh, in uh, software vendors related to the data. So before I work at MongoDB, Couchbase, Port, um, Oracle, but also a social platform called Exo. And as you can guess from my uh, accent, I'm coming from France. And uh, I am a, a Java developer, and I created a Java user group in, uh, where I live in Nantes. And you have some information about myself if you want to reach, reach me. Um, one slide about what is MAPAR. MAPAR provides a converged data platform that provides storage for the data from a file system, an OSQL database, streaming for all the events you will capture from your application. And at the top of that, you can build applications with many open source technologies, uh, coming from all the Hadoop ecosystem, Spark for processing, uh, Apache Drill for SQL uh, on any type of data. And during the demonstration, I will use, obviously, this platform. And you will see that the code is based on uh, open source uh, technologies. So the, the talk is about uh, data on motorsport, data on Formula One. And we will start with uh, why it's important for this type of uh, applications or this type of business, if we can call it a business. And then I will talk about demonstration, uh, show demonstration and explain the architecture. Because the way uh, this presentation has been built is we had a meeting with one of the Formula One team that was looking for a new way of dealing with the data. They have existing technology that is fully based on proprietary software uh, that cannot handle the new uh, volume of data, the new type of data. So they were looking on the market for different solutions. And what we provide and when we describe, it's an open source based architecture based on the uh, things that I will show today. So it's, the, it's really based on a business requirements from a real team. Unfortunately, they have not yet made any decisions, so they are not working with our product. I expect they will. Uh, so what's the point about data in motorsport? If you look, during a race, in Formula One in this case, but it could be in any of the very technical, mechanical sports, you will see many, many screens, many people looking at screens and looking at, looking at data. We see here so the, some engineers and a, a race driver uh, looking at many screens, for example, that provide feedback from the race, from the car, from the weather, uh, um, any data coming uh, inside the system. And some of the data, for example, will look this way. So it's based on some uh, a guy in Germany that is passionate about Formula One and is publishing many articles about the type of data and what they can do with it. And on the screen, you see multiple lines. So it's for one single car. And you will see at the top, uh, the, the red line will be the RPM, the number of uh, the speed of the engine, then the speed of the car in blue. Um, in, uh, in green, the G's and the lateral G's that you have when, you, uh, when the driver is in the car. And uh, the throttle, the, the gears of the engine. So many information coming in real time. And this is quite important to have this information to define strategy or to look at how the car is behaving. Uh, is it in a good state or not? And for example, on this other screen, they use some of the data about the lap, how long was for it, the time spent for doing a lap compared with when we kind of refuel the car on the, the, size, the, number, the volume of the fuel that you have in the car. 
to compare different options to see which, in which case you will be faster at the end of the race. So all this information is very, very important for uh, the driver, for the engineers to have a good understanding of the car itself and the strategies they have to put in place. And what is interesting is to look at the data you really have during a race. So when we discuss with the team, and if you look a little bit on the internet, you will see some interesting uh, fact on data about uh, racing cars on Formula One. For example, you have many, many sensors, and these numbers come from two years ago, one and a half, two years ago. Probably you even have more, no, more uh, sensors today. So you have 300 sensors in a car. We saw some of them, the speed, the engine, the Gs, but it's also the angle of the steering wheel, so everything you can imagine. The temperature of if each wheel, each brake, uh, so very detailed information. The data uh, have to communicate in the car and push to the paddock as fast as possible. So you have many channels sending data to be able to send the data uh, as fast as possible uh, to the paddock. Most of the time it's in two or less, two milliseconds, to send the data back from the car to the paddock. And they use their own uh, network to do that. For a race, 1.5 billion data points for uh, one car for a race, 5 billion because a weekend will be Friday, Saturday for the test, and Sunday for the race. And if you look at volume, because it doesn't mean any sense as uh, a 5 billion point, we don't know how, what, it, what it, it is in terms of volume, but what is interesting is to look at what's the volume of data that is really created. So 5 to 6 gigabytes of compressed binary data for one and a half hours of a race. And the most interesting number for me is this one. is for one single weekend on a single race, for all the cars, all the team, you have 240 terabytes of data that has been generated in 2014. So it's even more today. And one of the challenges the teams have, it's not necessary to generate the data. The data are generated by the sensor, so they are here. Not to send them from the car to the paddock, it's to be able to keep them for further analysis in the future. So every time they want to deal with a car during a race, during a training, during testing the car with different options on their private test, they want to be able to keep the data, to be able to compare day after day cars or engineering choice after engineering search, what's the behavior of the car. So you have many challenges here, starting with where do you store, how do you store, what can you do in terms of analytics and processing of the data? But also, the data that you have in 2014, in terms of values, attributes that you deal with, is probably not the same as what they did in 2016 uh, or 17, because you have new sensor, new type of data. So you have to be able to keep the data over time, but also uh, be able to leverage the new data type and the new information inside your process without breaking what has been done in the past. And in the current architecture, they use uh, 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 Microsoft SQL servers, and they have a lot of issues, not necessarily with the scalability, because they will create multiple, multiple database instances. They have issues with the flexibility, how we can evolve over time and continue to do analytics process and so on. So one of the solutions that I will, uh, will show you, it's about flexibility of the data type. So the way it works, uh, when you look on the paddock, it's more or less like this, is you have in the car many sensors that will capture the data and aggregate in real time on the car and sending the data to the network, to the paddock, and then distributed all the information between the teams, depending on each car and so on. And the idea here is to try to provide a new architecture where you can directly do analytics in real time. This is what you see in the screen. Be able to process uh, with some specific engineers uh, the data, giving more information than only real time data, but kind of uh, make some predictions, provide some feedback about what will be the next behavior of the car or the driver, 
analy analy doing some analysis to do the uh, to define or refine the strategy, strategy, but also trying to push. And this is one of the new architecture designs that we provide, and we want to provide to them. It's real-time replication from the race track to the factory. Could be in Italy, could be in a. In France, in England, depending on the team. So you push the data back to the, the back office, kind of. And as you see, you have no data coming in the other, the other direction. At least it could come from a factory to the team, but not from the team to the cars, because you are not allowed to modify automatically the car uh, features. Because what you want, you want still to have a human behavior of having the uh, race car driver in the car. Because technically, I'm sure that you see on your race car simulators on video, video games, they play alone. So it could be, we could technically replace a driver and change the behavior of the car without having go to uh, have a human interaction. The goal here is to provide data to the engineers that will communicate with the driver to say to him, oh, you have to slow down a little bit, you have to be careful because you are braking too much on these specific curves and so on. So they provide feedback, and then the human being will take action. So to show them to what will be the, the applications on the architecture, we build a small demonstration. And to simulate that, we we could not buy a Formula One. It's a little bit too expensive. And I don't know if I can drive it. I don't think I have the skill. So we use a simulator to generate data into a streaming technology and show the basic part of pushing the data into a dashboard in real time and storing the data into a platform to do some analytics to have a first step to build a new type of application. So what? I will show you now is the demonstration itself. And we, with some of my uh, colleagues, we were looking for a tool to generate data to simulate a race, uh, a race car. Uh, we found this uh, tool on uh, SourceForge. It's an open source racing car simulator. It's, uh, sorry, it's uh, written in C and C++. And in terms of volume of data, it's not huge, but if you are looking for something about uh, to do artificial intelligence, to manipulate uh, car behavior, physics, it's a very, very nice tool. Because you had many tracks, many cars, depending on if it's a very fast car, a slower car, a heavy car, and so on. So we use that to simulate race track on cars and generate data that will be pushed into the platform. So let's... Uh, me showing you the demonstration. So what I have, this is the Torx application running into a, a virtual box. Uh, and I will create a new race. And this new race will start multiple cars and simulate the car. And you see the data are pushed in real time into a dashboard. So what happened behind the scene, we stream the data into the uh, mapper streams on Kafka, and I will come back to that in a minute. But what is interesting to see is at the, t at the bottom of uh, this, you have some metrics. So this is a uh, gear, the speed of the engine, the speed of the car, the Gs, uh, the brake on the throttle. And what we do here, we send the data directly here for our, to have the speed. This is the speed by, uh, from the beginning of the race. You have the same for, for the engine. And what is, if you are really into racing cars and so on, what is interesting here is you see there are uh, slower engine, not a slower car, but slower engine, because it's between a, a 10,000 or 1,000, or I think it's 10,000 RPM on a, on a very fast racing car at the top. And the one that is in red is a red car that looks like a Formula One because this engine is a lot faster in terms of uh, speed of... Uh, so we send all this data. And a very interesting uh, graph that people need when they do the racing is this one, where 
uh, my track is maybe a little too long, when you compare the behavior of the car from lap to lap. Because you want to be able to see between two laps, how, what is the behavior of the car? Do you see a weird stuff that will uh, indicate that you have an issue either with the driver or with the car? So you can compare different laps, uh, uh, the same car on different parts of the track, laps after laps. So how, this, uh, how I have built this uh, demonstration? Uh, as I said, it's quite simple. Is the simulator pushing data into a streaming technology, real-time dashboard using uh, HTML. And also, I will come back to that in a minute, uh, some, some analytics. So the technology we use is, and I will go in a detail, and this is the important part of the talk, besides the number of data and the type of data we deal with, is the architecture saying what you want is to be able to stream data in real time, move data from one point to another, and Kafka is a way to go in terms of development, and we store the data not in a Kafka cluster, but in mapper streams, and we have multiple consumers. One of them is just pushing data back to the dashboard. The other one is storing the data for analytics. What I mean by storing the data for analytics is just be able to connect to the cluster and be able to execute some SQL queries. And what is interesting about this is if I go to this tool that is a SQL engine, Apache Drill, I can run any type of queries. I will just do two few lines. And this is just a car, a rest, um, the race ID. And if I remove what I want it, it to remove the group by. Ah, missing something. Here we go, sorry. So what we see here is for each car, each race, we generate some information in JSON in this case. I use JSON just for simplicity reasons, like as I can show you. I don't want to show you some binary content compressed and so on. And you see you have the race ID, the race times, the different sensors, like the distance, the RPM, and the speed. This is the data that we send. And using modern SQL engine, this is not a database. This is a purely query engine that can query a JSON database, some files, some relational database, some NoSQL database, depending on what you want to do, and do any type of aggregation. And what is uh, surprising, for me at least, because I've, I worked for nine years for Oracle, when I moved back to NoSQL, NoSQL, then uh, big data, it, SQL is still a very, very important language when you don't to do analytics. Not only because it's a powerful language, but more importantly, it's because you can connect this to many existing tools that people are using in the enterprise. Standard reporting tools like ClickView, Tableau, but also analytics platform for statisticians like SAS or uh, MATLAB, they are talking SQL. So this is why I, I, I show you this. It's not to say, oh, I could, it's back to the future or back to the past or whatever. Uh, it's even with modern storage engine, SQL has to be used because of the tooling at the top of it. An interesting part of, uh, of this architecture is the fact that that's the connection. Where do you store the data? And when you look at the volume of data that we manage, not here, but in the real use case, it's 200 terabyte, uh, more than 200 terabyte for three days. The volume itself is not an issue. If you have 10 terabyte of data or 20 terabyte of data, you can take any existing technology and it will work. You take a relational database, it will work. The issue is if you add, in this case, almost 100 terabyte every day, 
and you want to keep it, and you continue to add data, data, data. This is where it's a challenge. It's a challenge for storage, and it's a challenge how do you want to format, organize the data to be able to use them. And this is where big data platform has been built, and this is why big data platform has been built. It's to be a, allow you to store any type of data forever with a volume that can continue to change and grow. And you mostly have two big options. One is to store the data directly on the file system. And the file system will distribute the data, replicate the data to make them highly available, but also to allow the processing layer to read in parallel the files that you have to be able to process them faster. And you usually use a file system when you don't want to modify the data, when you just add new information, and when you want to scan them very quickly. As soon as you want to be able to quickly access a single line or 10 lines on a billion, or you want to modify the data, the file system itself are not very efficient. So you have to use a, a database. And in this case, in the big data platform, you use most of the time a NoSQL database. This is what I use in the demonstration. I use a JSON database that is MapperDB JSON, but it could be any other NoSQL database that you, depending on your need. And very often you work with both uh, storage for the same application or the same data set. For example, you will keep all the data, all the tick coming from the car on the file system forever. And when you want, for example, to give some information back to the engineer saying, can you look at the behavior of this car at this specific race track at this specific time and so on, you will run a process that will do some aggregation and transformation and store the result into the NoSQL engine to give you more flexibility in the way you want to uh, work with the data. And you can modify and enrich the information. For example, if during a race, a car has a weird behavior, the engine starts to have something wrong, you want to be able to analyze that, keep the data, put the data in the NoSQL engine to be able to command to be able to use that in your artificial intelligence modeling to be able to predict or try to find a prediction the next time you will have the same behavior in the car. So you mix both storage depending on your need uh, of the application. So a big part of the architecture, it's about data streaming. Data streaming, it's about moving data from one point to another and storing, if you want, all the events. When I say data in this case, data or events will be the same. It's just we generate data on the fly. And one way of looking at big data, big data, it's one event after one event after one event after one event. In this case, it's just each tick from a sensor, it's one event streamed into the system. Because you have billions of them, it's becoming a large database. If you look at the e-commerce platform, every time you pay, it is one event. And because you have many customers or many clicks on your website, this becomes a data. This becomes a big data. So the technology we use uh, in this demonstration, it's based on the Kafka API. And as I said, if you need large-scale distributed streaming, look at Kafka. It has been built initially by LinkedIn. Uh, now it's an Apache project supported by many companies. And the model, it's a, cl a classical producer-consumer publish subscribe model within the middle, all the events will be stored uh, in, a, in a specific order to allow you to replay for each consumer. For example, in my case, when I was in real time doing the processing to save, uh, to show the data into a, a dashboard, to save the data into a database, I can read again the same data to do something else. And I will take an example when we talk about extensions on new services. The way it works, it's, uh, Kafka has been built for scalability. You, you should be able to publish and read millions of messages per second. Not everybody needs this, but it's wa it was one of the requirements. It has to be distributed, it has to be highly available to be able to handle the scale. And for that, when you talk about data that you have to keep, that you have to store, the only, way to, uh, the only way that I know to be efficient and scalable is to partition the data. It's to take any subset of the data, move them on a specific set of machines. 
So Kafka is working this way on a specific topic. So when you send a message on a car, for example, it will be sent into a topic that could be partitions on multiple machines. And in this case, I have three partitions. And when I write, my application that generates the data will distribute the write on all these machines. And if you need more data or more write every second, you just add partitions to the topic. So this is the way you scale out when you talk about the write. For the read, it's exactly the same. When you have multiple uh, topics or one topic, if you want to read, you have to read in parallel on multiple machines. And the consumer will be set in a group reading the same topic, but each consumer will read a partition. So you read in parallel. The impact of that, and this is if we go back to this slide, is that the order of the messages, it's only guaranteed by partition. So suppose I have a partition for each car in my system. I cannot be sure that the, if the two messages, the car number one and car number two, car number two provides a message first, push a message first on a specific topic number two, car number one, push a message on the topic number one, just after, when I read the data, I cannot be sure that my consumer will read the car number two before the car number one. But I am sure that all the events of a car will be read in, read in the same order. So it's just one of the things we have to understand when we do uh, Kafka, because of the partitions and because what the focus is distributed the distribution of the load, be able to store as much message as I want, but you have the guarantee of the order. It's only by partition. So the way you deploy Kafka is you have many applications on consumer, producer on consumer. So you will have multiple process on multiple machines, so multiple brokers that will store different topics. And this is how it works. So this is a cluster of uh, information. And what we have done into Mapper, it's instead of using this architecture in the middle, we keep the same producer and consumer, and we replace the middleman by the, Kafka, the Mapper cluster, providing the, the file system, the database, and the stream on the same, uh, inst and on the same technology to simplify the administration. Because keep in mind that if you need a file system, you need another cluster. If you need a NoSQL database, you need another cluster. And the idea of Mapper was just to use the same API. In our case, it's Kafka API 9. Use the same characteristic when you write and read. So the code is exactly the same. But the, the way we store the messages, it's, a, it's a different. It's transparent for developers. It's supposed to make the life easier for administrator. Bigger is the cluster, simpler it will be compared with Kafka. From a code point of view, when you want to produce an, an event, you just have to call the Kafka API, pro producer record, and then producer send with a message. And if you are Kafka user, you see the string slash apps, slash racing, slash streams, uh, sensor data. This is the name of the topic. But what is before sensor data? It's what we call a stream in, uh, in Mapper. This is the location of the data on the cluster. So it's just a little, this is the only difference between Kafka and Mapper streams. It's how do you name a topic. When you want to consume, same. You have a consumer, uh, uh, a, a consumer uh, API that allows you to receive messages. And every time you will receive messages, you will have the, uh, uh, an iterator on your read on process. At the end, you have the record value for it, sorry, and this is where you process the data. So this is what I use, for example, to push the data on a web UI or uh, save the data in the database. And I will come back to the demo later on. One of the key points about this architecture, and this is one of the key requirements when we talk with the team, it's to be able to evolve over time, to be able to quickly deal with more data, uh, be able to capture more data. In this demonstration, 
we only store on Capture 3 data points, speed, RPM, and distance, in addition to time on the car. And we buffered uh, the information in a JSON document. But ideally, you want to be able quickly to add a new sensor. For example, the throttle, the gears of the engine. So you will just have to add that into your data structure. In this case, as I said before, I use JSON just because it's easier to debug, it's easier to show you. Internally, they use binary format and proprietary format that is very optimized to be as, to be as small as possible. Uh, so one way is to be able to, uh, one requirement is to have the flexibility. And if you look at the SQL statement as, that I use as a Kafka code that I use, it's transparent because this is a producer that generates the data structure that is responsible of the schema, if you want, and the application consuming the data is also responsible of dealing with the field. Uh, one of the key rules, if you want to do that and be able to keep your application running, don't remove field. When you have terabyte of terabyte of data, if you have a few million lines with a field that is not used anymore, it's not a big deal except if it's a terabyte of videos. But if it's a simple field like that with the gear, you don't need the gear anymore because it's an electric car and all the gas-powered engine does not exist anymore. Who cares? You keep it. It's not a big deal. And try to not change the data type of a field. Because as soon as you do that, all the existing code will break. So add new field. Do not change the data type. So if you need to change the data type, create a new field. And do not, because changing the data type, if you have terabyte of terabyte of terabyte of data, you don't want to read 10 years of history to modify each field. Be smarter. Do that when you read, instead of trying to change the storage. So another part of the system, you may have attended in this conference and other many, uh, many presentations about microservices, architecture, and so on. This talk is not about microservices at all, but one of the be benefits of microservice is to be able to adapt quickly to change, be able to develop new services, change existing services very fast, with one of the benefits of using Kafka in the middle, you can also add and modify services very quickly. In this case, what I want, in addition to the dashboard, the storage for analytics, I want to be able to do some stream processing. I want to be able to capture in real time the event and do something with it. And what the two concepts that are important here on this slide is one, we talk about the streaming, the data stream, move data from one point to another. The other one is stream processing, take the data, and work with it. So data streaming on stream processing. And in big data, on MAPA, the biggest library that we use is Spark. This is the most used uh, project that we see. And keep in mind that is base is made to be distributed. It's a cluster computing platform. If you have two terabytes of data, you don't necessarily need Spark. You have other library to do the same. This is useful when you, want to be, when you have to capture data in real time or store data on disk and read on many machines. So Spark has been built with the same kind of paradigm in mind that you had MapReduce initially, Apache MapReduce, to be able to distribute the process and have a simple API on rich API to transform and reach the data. But the key part is has been built to be a lot faster than MapReduce because it uses less disk, more memory. So one is uh, using Apache Spark. Another possibility is to use Flink, another Apache project uh, that provide same a distributed compute engine uh, to do uh, processing of the data, machine learning, complex event processing. The big difference between Spark on Flink, besides the fact that Spark has a bigger community today, it's just where do they come from? What's the DNA of each of the framework? 
Spark has been built first as a batch-oriented framework to do large processing of data on a distributed cluster, and they add streaming after. Flink has been built first as a data stream platform to do stream processing and add the complex event processing on the batch processing to the platform. And, and uh, in my case, for this demonstration, I choose to use Flink, but I could, I could have done exactly the same code using Spark. So you have the running system. The cars could be running. We store the data. We have the dashboard. And what I want is I want to process the data in real time. So what I will do is I will start a new race. Cars will start. The demo will refresh. The dashboard should refresh. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't deploy. Uh, just have to be careful of which. Uh, demo I'm using. So what I have here, I'm using Flink, standard Flink API. I am connected to, a, I have a specific environment, and I'm connected to the same topic on Kafka. As you see, it's a Kafka, Flink Kafka consumer. And what I do, I want to receive, I will remove this, I want to receive all the event group by the car ID, then calculate the average speed of the car. And I print it, just for, the, for this demonstration. So every time you have an event, what will happen is you will see the speed of each car. This is the average speed from the beginning of the race for each car. And every time you have an event, this is recalculated automatically. Ideally, what I should do with that, I should push it into a dashboard or do some analytics. What you can do also is to compare or some, do some aggregations. And Flink has, has some interesting library that, for example, I want to time window. I want to aggregate the average speed for the last five seconds, for the last 10 seconds, for the last lap, if I know how many. So I have some uh, functions to do that. For example, if I want to aggregate every five seconds, it will capture the messages and do the aggregation. So you can. Uh, do many calculations on aggregation with uh, Flink on Spark. For example, you do complex event processing. So if the average speed of the car compare with the location on the track, compare with the speed of the engine, as this behavior, we can raise an alert. So you have a, so in this case, we should re she refresh every five seconds, or maybe the race is over. No, every five seconds. So. What I showed you is stream processing, streaming of the data, flexibility in the way you want to add services, but also um, creating new application on your service. And one important part about this, it's not related only to Formula One. You can extend that to many types of applications. Think about payment. Transaction on the website, you want to do fraud detection. Capture the message in real time. Think about e-commerce. You want to capture the behavior of your user using the click stream, behavior of the car to do a, predict, a recommendation on the next page, on this kind of stuff. So you can extend that. And I use that, the same architecture with some of our customers in telcos, in finance, in retail, in IT, behavior of your machines on your application. You want to predict when you want to start new Docker container for your uh, front end, for example. You can use this stuff. I didn't say content because personally I didn't work on a content management system with this technology. I have one minute to uh, take questions. And uh, questions, and in the same time I will show you another demo that is fun, just for the fun of it. So if you have questions, I need to put that. 
I look like a... So, no, I cannot talk to myself. So, I was looking for a technology to, instead of using the car simulator, to use these physical machines. So I found this game. It's called Anki. And he used Bluetooth to communicate with my laptop. I use Node.js to capture the event, and I have exactly the same architecture that you have seen before. So what I have is a new version of the dashboard. It uses the same it uses Vertex as a framework. Vertex, if you this is the name of the framework that I use. And I have a small uh, API that I use to uh, start the demonstration, connect to the car, and so on. So I connect to the car, they should switch to blue. Oh, my sorry, my uh, server is dead. So I'm starting the Node.js server. Connect to the car, they switch to blue. They start to send info, or one of them at least, and uh, I start the demo. So one of them, for whatever reason, I won't debug it, but I send, you see the speed of the car, and I can change the speed of the car, for example. These go faster, these go faster to the screen, and we can go crazy. So I am done with the presentation since I need to pack everything. If you ask questions, do not hesitate to ask questions, and we can discuss after. Thank you.